Hey, folks. That might be a bit much. <laughs> How's that? All right, so I'll let him adjust the uh, audio as we talk, and feel free to settle in. My name's Dan Malinger. I'm here with Think Big Analytics. So just to give you a little bit of background, I'll be talking today about uh, big analytics and what that really means and how it's coming to life. So Think Big, this is you know, really our bread and butter. We are what you call a pure play services firm. It's a fancy way of saying we're consultants. Uh, give me a thumbs up if the audio is still OK. OK, just making sure. So it's a fancy way of saying we're consultants. We're exclusively in the big data space. So we work with clients around the engineering and analytics of big data, hence big analytics. Uh, and our perspective fundamentally is that big data and big analytics are driving some new capabilities and new opportunities as a horizontal across industry. Talking about non-traditional formats, unstructured data. It's going beyond just text. I think sometimes you know, we say, oh, unstructured means text. It really is going past that. So working with clients around you know, things like call logs, being on the front lines of what's happening with your products as customers reach out and interact with your brand. Raw video, satellite photo processing. So that's very big in finance around the investing uh, side of things. So a great example of that is you, know, you can do things like use satellite imagery photos to look at the depth of boats in the water which if you have a cargo ship, retailers are figuring out how much of their product they want to get off those ships. Earliest signal uh, some folks have found in terms of understanding customer demand is the depth of cargo ships in the water at the dock. You know what they're holding, you know the depth of the water, you know how much re uh, inventory they've left on the boat as opposed to getting out to stores. It's an interesting world of using unstructured data to get ahead of the market. Kind of moving into some of the newer things folks are talking about, you guys have seen the notion of exhaust data, I think. It's becoming an increasingly popular notion. It's byproduct data. So every time I interact with a service electronically with a product, there's in between me and the app or product I'm interacting with, there might be a dozen computers all working in concert, all talking to each other, all producing byproduct data. And buried in there is real signal about me. And it's signal that either we haven't seen before or it's available to actors in the market that didn't have it before. So an interesting example we'll talk through uh, a bit more as we talk about this, one of our clients is in the DNS space. Uh, DNS for the uninitiated at a very high level is basically just all the mappings of domains, internet domains, so like facebook.com to IP addresses. Right? The DNS folks are just the folks who keep track of what is the IP address in a computer of a website. That's it. But buried in all that information is actually a ton of insights around what's going on with consumers and what's going on with them in near real time. Something that wasn't really appreciated prior. So a really exciting new trend, uh, and, and we'll talk about this a bit more as well, is uh, folks are really focusing on data about data. So historically, all of our machines, all of our infrastructure have logged information about what's going on with our data, with the access patterns to our data. And they've gone to a log, and the only time anyone's touched it is when IT said, hey, was the server up? Really digging into that, there's a lot of really interesting signals, especially about our own organization. So a lot of you folks who are thinking about you know, being better and innovating in predictive analytics, particularly on the organization side, we talk about democratizing data, talk about creating data-driven organizations. Whatever your vernacular is for that, there's a question of, hey, are folks in my organization really touching the data and leveraging the data? That's all buried in the data about the data. It's in the access systems, the access logs. What's going on with folks across the organization? If I built this system, how wide is the reach of folks reaching in and touching our new data and trying to drive insights out of it? Similarly, as you really expand outside of that into email logs, you know, when folks are checking email, your knowledge base access, all of those things, Analytic HR systems are getting innovative and in thinking about, can we understand our employees? And it's not just about carrot and stick or about giving someone a slap on the wrist for not checking their email enough. It's about understanding what success profiles in our organization look like. Right? Are our top performers accessing the knowledge base or is it the folks who aren't retaining knowledge? Are, you know, is checking your email at 11 p.m. a sign that you know, you're deeply engaged with our organization, or is it a sign that you're nearing burnout in three months from now, I should expect another employer to snatch you up? These are the insights we're starting to get about, again, kind of this data about the data. So 
tie to that within this big analytics, we want to talk about opportunity. When I say this, I'm really talking about the conceptual side of things. So, so how do we rethink the data and the approaches and how, to, uh, and how we leverage them? So one of the big changes that's happening as we think about big analytics, analytics over big data, is the notion of fingerprinting. So I'll give you a couple examples and we'll talk about what this really means. Uh, so, so one example, if you think about when you're at an ATM and you enter in your PIN, and let's just say mine is one, two, three, four. Don't try that. All uh, right, do, do I do one, two, three, four? One, two, three, four, do I pause? What's that syncopation says a lot about me. The firms are realizing, you can see if someone stole someone's PIN because everyone enters in this number sequence a little bit differently. It's a fingerprint about who they are. As we'll talk about a little bit later, you can see a fingerprint across the internet of malicious actors right before a terrible denial of service attack happens. So those you know, bad hacking attacks that bring down government websites, and Visa got hit with one the last year or two. Uh, that synchronization, before the actual attack, we see a lot of computers synchronizing and talking to one malicious player. It changes the entire topology of the internet. And it creates a fingerprint around that actor who's synchronizing all of those machines. And you can pull that out. So if you think about what that means conceptually, for those of you who are more analytically oriented, right, we're not looking within a single record and saying, hey, what's unique about this record? We're looking across records. We're looking at right, all of the different activities across all of the different machines tied to, you know, let's say, one actor or whatever it might be, and asking, what are the patterns there? So what we're really doing is we're taking the data, we're turning it on its side, we're transposing it. And in a sense, we're thinking about everything in terms of high dimensional spaces. And the critical thing there, just quantitatively, right, is that you're creating very wide uh, vectors that represent things. So think about it from an entropy standpoint, right? We're creating targets that have a whole lot of entropy. They're able to separate between individual actors and a high number of actors fairly well. That's the notion of fingerprinting. And it's really critical because we start doing, and we'll talk about it in a second a little bit more, over customer behaviors. It turns the whole notion on its head. We, we obsess over things like social security numbers, email addresses, logins. Why? because it's the only way we could really tie someone down. But if we can think about a person and identify a person based off this vector that describes their behaviors, their interests, or whatever kind of insight I have in my more anonymous interactions with those customers, I can understand them and give them a better experience even before they agree to give me their information. And that's what you're seeing in particular in physical retail where there's a real problem. There's no logging into a store, uh, maybe Foursquare, but... Uh, <laughs> And not in general. But with cell phone communication now, near field communication is going to change this. The particular set of apps that I allowed to broadcast on my phone, the settings they choose with them, right? That's my wide vector that defines who I am. You can track me over time. Folks are doing that now with, uh, if you've gone to a mall and you see those touch screens, right? How I walk up to the mall, where I touch, that's something about my height, how I move, right? That two dimensional space is effectively my wide vector that's gonna start enabling us to pinpoint. And when you combine that with the first few early clicks, you can start targeting people, understanding who they are, what segments they fall into. So the other conceptual change I really wanna call out is the notion of leveraging dark data. So dark data is very simply, it's not a type of data, it's the data you forgot about. It's just all the stuff you're not using today, right? Classic example is audit logs. The data that you had to keep because your regulator told you you did, and no one knew how to touch it because it went off onto some SAN or tape drive or whatever, and it was way too big and way too uh, uh, fine-grained for anyone to really be able to process before anyway. Now with Big Analytics Solutions, you're gonna be able to get access to that, and that's where we're gonna start being able to see new things. We talked about it in terms of employee logs, also call it another fun example, architectural records. Right? What's, what's darker than architectural records? Even architects don't wanna look at them, but now, and uh, energy companies want to. Because if I know how much, in particular think of an office building now, if I know how much energy you're consuming, and I know something about the architecture of your building, I can start teasing out where the energy savings are. Do you have an inefficient configuration in your system? Or more of the point, is there an earlier or later time you can turn on the heat, that's kind of a classic example, uh, to, to reduce your overall energy spend or to use the energy at a less expensive time because in the markets they fluctuate by day or by hour. So dark data is enabling all of that. So, so as we think about you know, how are we getting engaged with big analytics, two examples of thinking about with your organization, right? Rethinking how I think identity 
and rethinking what data is really available and what do I want to access and act upon. There we go. So within that, we're going to talk about a little bit about approaches. You guys have seen this the last you know, two to five years, depending on industry. Folks have really started working on analytic approaches that leverage non-traditional structures, really emphasizing things like high dimensionality. So you know, everyone's got their new kernel method or whatever it might be. On the tech side of things, classification is you know, becoming more and more bread and butter. Uh, so, so sentiment analysis, which you know, is the thing, right? It's really just text classification, uh, whether it's based off bag of words or it's based off engrams or people start digging into uh, the deeper structure of the sentence, which would be things like part of speech tagging. All of those, we've talked about image. That's, those have been some of the techniques that have really been taking hold and coming to life in big analytics over the last, again, two to five years. Over the next two years, you're going to see an emphasis on at least a piece of what's called deep learning. So deep learning is that notion of building out the hierarchy, hierarchical learning. It, it, it's the way I always think about it, if anyone's uh, uh, more cognitively inclined. Uh, John Tooby and Lita Cosmides have a great phrase. Uh, thinking of the mind as a Swiss Army knife, not uh, just a simple association solver, association network. Right? We have lots of smart sub-programs in our mind that help us solve individual tasks. And when they all come together, that's what lets us solve problems. That's what hierarchical neural nets do. That's what a lot of emphasis of deep learning is. A lot of that is not really feasible over big analytic paradigms. So if you think about big analytics, uh, we're usually talking about tools and technologies and architectures that leverage MapReduce. MapReduce is really built for different kinds of techniques than those hierarchies. Things like the back propagation step in a neural network does not play nicely over MapReduce. Things like bootstrap models, or a lot of folks like to talk about bagging, right? Uh, bootstrap aggregation. Think about what a random forest is. Right? Lots of separate for, uh, uh, models that are all running over resampled data, maybe with some feature dropouts, then pulling together in the end. That's shared nothing parallelism. It's a natural alignment with bootstrap models. The data flow, partitioning of complex logic for hierarchical models, once you already understand what that hierarchy is, MapReduce is great for that. It's not great for the solving of that hierarchy. So what aspects of deep learning are going to come in most quickly to big analytics? It's called feature learning. So right, if we're working over these new conceptually very wide data sets, these data sets that are much messier, their image, their text, their features across records, we're still going to need domain experts. We're still going to need people who really think about how to create features and how to build smart models. But they're going to be enabled by some automation of feature identification processes. And that's a huge part of deep learning. And that's something that does play a little bit nicer with MapReduce. So over the next two years, we're going to see a lot more of an emphasis in big analytics on package solutions for enabling feature learning. So if all of that's there, if we've got some great data, we've got some analytic approaches, we know the future's holding some you know, great cool stuff, why aren't we just going out and you know, making our billion dollars? right? The reality is there are a lot of challenges here. And the challenges are not the data. They're not the analytic technique. They're not you know, understanding how I might drive more money out of my customers. It's fundamentally making it all come to life in an organization. These are organizational challenges. So if you look at what happens, right? everything we've talked about, think about dark data. It's the greatest example of it. It's the data you haven't touched before. It's the data that only IT knows how to access because it's in some you know, archaic ser server somewhere that you know, people have been logging on to data to for, uh, for the last 20 years, whatever it might be, seven years if you're in finance, right? If you want to access that, you've got to be embedded in that IT organization. You have to be programmatically and engineeringly a bit more savvy than we typically expect from an analytics organization. So the most common thing is the folks who are doing big analytics, we call them data scientists, we put them under the office of the CTO, and we say, go find me value. It immediately disconnects from the business value in the organization. And even if you have a technology leader, a CTO, whoever, who's savvy enough and thoughtful enough and forward thinking enough to bring that business value perspective into the process, you're still going to have a challenge. And the easiest way to think about that challenge is to think about what we do really well today. Business intelligence. So how does business intelligence work? Right, so if we're in a larger firm, we have you know, 50, 100, 300, 500 SaaS modelers today. And they're back there doing some deeper, more complex modeling. 
We have BI teams who are at the front lines thinking about the domain that we work in, the market, what's happening, and they're watching things take place real time, whether they're you know, using Cognos or they're using you know, newer products like Clickstream. They're watching what's happening with our customers, our products, and our markets in a less, less mathematically sophisticated way. Should be careful about that. But when they see things, they're coming back to the analysts and saying, hey, wait, is this a real pattern? When the analysts find things, they're working back with the business teams to say, hey, it, does this re reflect a deep insight? Does this reflect a change in the market? Does this reflect just a byproduct of some product change that actually isn't very meaningful? It's kind of spurious. That feedback loop is how we do business today. It's how we understand how to actually bring value to an organization because we have the right folks in the team to be able to think about what matters, how to achieve it, how feasible it is, at what cost, and, and what fundamental impact it has to our business. Big analytics, what do we do? We, we, we take someone who kind of knows engineering, who, who knows a lot of math, and we put them off by themselves. Fundamentally, that's the challenge. The, the biggest challenge is in bringing all of this stuff together. So how do we do that? The big, the, to start with, the biggest thing is really thinking about this as a partnership. Right? So business is not a customer of big analytics, of data science. Of, Pick your term there, because they're a little bit loaded. Right? Critically, we need to think about a way of bridging the gap. Uh, I'm working with a client now in the financial industry, uh, and it terrifies me, because they say things, they're big analytics folks, you know, they point over to the business and uh, BI teams, and they say, oh, they don't have the skills. They don't know what we know. We have to teach them. And there's no notion of, well, wait a minute, we have to learn from them. They have all of the domain knowledge. They have the insight of what's going on day to day with our customers, with our products, and our market. They understand the domain critical stuff. Not only that drives value, right? it's really easy to say, hey, what matters to the business? But in understanding what the real patterns are in the relationship, they're, or in the data, they're not purely quantitative, right? I, I think probably most folks in this room don't believe in blind empiricism. But if you're not tied, to your business teams, if you're not thinking about not just what matters to the business, but also how the data was created and what it really represents, it doesn't matter how much hand waving you have around it. You are in the world of empiricism. Right? We have to be able to tie these things together in a meaningful way. And what we've found is fundamentally the most successful alignment that I've seen on client teams is starting off, let's start off by recognizing we're talking about a process. And you'll notice I, I interchange big analytics and data science a bit. Uh, it's a personal habit. So right, we're talking about you know, doing the same statistics we've always done, integrating it with business the same way we felt like we could do with BI and processes like that. But we also have a bit of salesmanship, organizational salesmanship, right? Helping folks understand and understand why what we're doing, these new things we're doing, actually positively okay. impact the business, why they're worth investing in. That's a whole other skill set right there. And then we've got to tie the engineering bit to it. Because again, remember, these big analytic systems, these big data systems, they're new. They're cumbersome. They are not friendly to interact with. There is no click. Right? It's all programming away on it and in new ways. So we have a very divergent set of skills that we need to bring together. And instead of looking to bring those together in one person and then also hope they'll have all the organizational perspectives, you know, what's going on in IT with the data? Where is the dark data? What's going on with you know, the analytical teams and what are the approaches we know and how do we leverage this uh, data today and what really matters to our business. Instead, bring those people together. One of the most successful big analytics teams I've ever seen, uh, it was a great team, uh, an energy client of ours. Uh, there was a young woman who was part of their data quality team, actually, but she, she was very, very mathematically and technically oriented. So she was a great programmer, a great statistician, and, and just really loved that stuff. She was working closely with uh, another one from their BI team, who was, again, very tied to the front lines, understood what was happening day to day with their customers, but she liked to use R instead of uh, some of the other tools. So she was a little more comfortable working with messy data and doing a little bit of programming. We had another gentleman from uh, kind of a similar business insights group, but elsewhere in the organization, who had some very unique perspectives and some new things he was kind of working off on the side. And he joined in with them 
as did one of their product leaders. And crossing the organization, having those four units come together, four different perspectives with four different skill sets together brought a deep, big analytic competency. And that's one of the core things to remember. Right? If we're thinking about this as a cross-functional team, if we're thinking about how all of this is new skills, it's not analytics 2.0. It's not, hey, I'm gonna take my SaaS teams and teach them the new tool, teach them how to access the new data system. We're talking about a new way of doing work and embracing that and aligning it organizationally is absolutely critical to success. So we've gotta be able to think about this in terms of these cross-functional teams, in terms of what it means to have at a minimum new team at you know, perhaps the most if you're really engaging in uh, kind of a full big data uh, process, we're talking about a new organization. And so we've gotta think about what that actually means. One of the things that always surprises me when, when, we, when I go to these conferences is we'll talk about thought leadership, talk about you know, what's happening in the market, I've got a vision on you know, what folks will be doing five years from now or you know, what the coolest technique in the market is. We rarely talk about organizational leadership. All right, so, so, so you know, big analytics, data science, big data, whatever it is, it's gonna transform your organization and you don't have to talk about organizational leadership to make that happen, it, it'll just happen. It won't. Bluntly, it, it won't. So, so we've gotta be able to think about those teams and we've gotta be able to realize them to a successful alignment. And, and so that's where things like measurement, again, just like we were talking about earlier with uh, measuring employee, interaction with our systems. It's not about the carrot and stick. It's not about giving someone a slap on the wrist. It's about the fact that, for example, defining performance metrics forces you to think about what do I really want out of this? And it aligns because the flip side of bringing a cross-functional group together is you get a great diversity of talent and of perspectives and it's fantastic up until you realize they all have different incentives. All right, so everything's great up until they all work under very different value propositions. Defining things like your performance metrics aligns those cross-functional groups together. It gives them a shared purpose. That's the reason you define performance metrics. It's about purpose. So as we think about what does it mean to really become successful with big analytics, we're asking what does it mean to be successful in organization building. So what I'd like to do just briefly is kind of walk you through an example of how we've done this for a client. So I'd mentioned a few times a client of ours who's in the DNS space. We help them go through a bit of this transition. I think it helps make this process concrete. So we engaged them early on. They, they had had some big analytics capabilities in their organization, but it was disparate. It, it was in a few different groups and they weren't really pulled together. And so while they had some interesting capabilities, they weren't really tying it into impacting or impactful, I always forget which is which, uh, uh, meaningful value to the organization. So the first thing we did is we helped them really get started with the notion of right implement. Let's get in there, let's do some big analytics, let's show that we can drive these things together. So we're going through, we're doing big analytics, we actually help them with that botnet solution I was talking about, right? identifying where attackers are in the internet before they attack. And this led to a patent. Patents are great, but they don't drive that level of value, right? They don't, unless you're a very particular kind of company, it doesn't make you money. So the next step was really starting to build out and think about that cross-functional team. So improving those botnet models was something we were doing along the side, but then we started going through that process of, hey, if we're gonna build out a cross-functional team, what are the tools we need? What are the trainings that we need to think about? What's that early win this team can come together and really achieve? And critically, what we found is that in order to bring that to, successfully together in an organization, it was starting to identify who really wanted to be part of this process, right? So, so if you guys have lived through it, organizational change is tough. Finding those actors who are excited about doing things like big analytics and letting them self-select into this group is a huge win. And over on the side here, I'll just call out, right? I have a picture of uh, Splunk. The reason being is part of this, right, is letting folks speak the same language, enabling folks to see the same data. So you have, you know, your great hardcore you know, programmers and analytics folks, and they can touch you know, big data, they can start doing big analytics, you're bringing them together across this functional team, maybe with someone who's more on the BI or business side, and they don't have those skills. So they need a way to be able to touch and see the same data for this to become more than just a thought exercise. And so at the time, Splunk actually had one of the best interfaces to big data. Uh, if you're doing it over Hadoop now, there's something called Hunk, uh, and it's an increasing pattern there, but that was part of the tool selection, is figuring out how to help folks have a common language. 
And then we moved into actually building that organization. So what we have up here are all the little buckets that define functional roles. And in that notion of really helping our client build out an operating model, that's where as you start thinking about this cross-functional group, you start asking questions about governance. How do, how do we enable data access? How do we enable big analytics? while still protecting our brand, because there are things you'll find that you don't want folks sharing. Right? You, you can find some very personal things about your customers. Uh, ownership and accountability patterns. We walk through process. Right? So, so if we needed to do a new use case, if we needed to integrate a new data set, where does that ownership lie and has it flow across these groups? And then road mapping their big analytics. And so when we think about it, right, the biggest challenge is we're not the tools and technologies. All of that's there, and there's some very exciting new stuff. But enabling our people to do it is fundamentally an organizational challenge, an organizational question. So I, I apologize. I, I went a little bit over, so I don't think we're going to have time for questions. Sorry about that. But uh, I, I will be here the rest of the day. Excited to talk to folks. And, and we'll be here at the 6 PM. I've got a lot of my team from Think Big here with me. And we'd love to talk to you. If you guys have any questions about the talk, about big analytics, or what's going on in the industry, love to do it. Thank you.